The second major concept in evolutionary thinking is randomness. It's the role of chance in evolutionary events. And random things are also referred to as neutral processes. And neutrality means selection is not operating. Things are neither being selected or not being selected. They're just neutral. There are two general reasons for neutrality. One is that many genotypes may produce the same phenotype. That's because the genetic code is redundant, because some DNA is not expressed, because some amino acid substitutions actually produce no difference in the shape or function of a protein, and because development is canalized. The other major reason is that many phenotypes may have essentially the same fitness. So even if you produce a phenotype, there is still another level at which randomness can occur or neutrality can arise. That can be either because that particular trait is varying in a way that makes very little difference to reproductive success, or because the impact on fitness of a change in one trait compensates for that of a change in another trait. Let's unpack those conditions. First, the genetic code is redundant. It produces 23 different meanings, that is either a start or stop codon or coding for a particular amino acid, and it uses 64 triplet codons to do so. So just to take one example, you can see here that proline is being coded for by four different codons. So that variation is usually at the third position. So all of the DNA sequences that are coding for proline are starting with CC. And it is the fourth position that can be different. Excuse me, the third, the third position in the codon that can be different. Then some DNA is not expressed. Pseudogenes, for example, are genes that are no longer expressed. Here we have an example of a pseudogene. Uh, in the chimpanzee, this gene is functional. In humans, it is not functional. And there have been three different mutations between humans and chimpanzees, an insertion, a deletion, and a point mutation. So pseudogenes result from a gene duplication that's usually followed by loss of function in one copy. Function is lost because the pseudogene is not expressed. All of its nucleotides are then free to diverge at random as they mutate. And so you see that in a pseudogene there will be a buildup of genetic variation from mutation. Some other DNA is also neither described, uh, transcribed nor translated. It's also free to accumulate mutations at random. So Although we've recently discovered that much more of the genome is functional than we had thought, there are still portions of the genome that are essentially free to vary at random because they are not having impact on phenotypes. So here is an example of what happens when a particular variant is neutral. Alpha globin evolution in vertebrates has had many amino acid substitutions. Down here on the x-axis, we have time in millions of years. And on the y-axis, we have the number of amino acid substitutions. And each spot is a comparison between animals that have been evolving over the last 500 million years and are examined today. What we can see is that the line is very close to straight. And that is what we would expect if the rate of amino acid substitution is uniform and that means it's occurring at random. This happens in alpha globin evolution because there are parts of the molecule where an amino acid substitution makes essentially no difference to its function. And those are the parts of that molecule in which the randomness is occurring. It is not occurring in the functional center where the oxygen binding is occurring. The next mechanism that produces neutrality in evolution is canalization, the canalization of development. Canalization is a word that means the limitation of phenotypic variation by developmental mechanisms. 
Catalyzing mechanisms are those that resist the tendency of variation in either genetic or environmental factors to perturb the phenotype. You can think of them as buffering the phenotype against variation in genes and variation in the environment. Genes whose impact on the phenotype has been reduced or eliminated by catalyzing mechanisms are then freer to accumulate neutral variation than those whose impact is directly expressed. So if development is sitting between the genes and the phenotype and is buffering the impact of variation in the genotype on variation in the phenotype, then the genotype is actually freer to vary. It can accumulate more mutations. Some of the traits that are canalized in tetrapods include four limbs, two eyes, one mouth, five digits. Genetic variation is affecting many things about these traits, but it is not affecting their number. Their number is canalized. Now, another reason for neutrality is that there is some phenotypic variation that makes very little difference to reproductive success. This is another level at which neutrality arises. The population may be too small to establish a consistent correlation between the trait and reproductive success. That is a sampling issue. Or the variation may simply be irrelevant. For example, Variation in traits that can't be detected by mates or pollinators or predators or parasites or prey, so it simply can't be detected. Or variation that lies within the so-called normal ranges of blood tests, if total cholesterol is between 110 and 150, or systolic blood pressure is between 100 and 130, or diastolic blood pressure is between 65 and 85. Anything within that range is not likely to be affecting reproductive success very much. Another reason is for neutrality is that a fitness gain in one trait can compensate for a fitness loss in another if those traits are connected by a trade-off. If the compensation is precise, then change will be neutral. It could happen in principle with any trade-off, including more offspring, less survival, more success fighting for mates, less resistance to disease, more resistance to normal infection, more costs of inflammation. Those are all significant trade-offs, all involved with medical issues, and if the compensation is precise, then it's possible that you could have people with many different offspring who had the same reproductive success because they had very many different survivals. Or more success fighting for mates, less resistance to disease, and so forth. If the compensation is precise, you'll get neutrality. However, the compensation is often not terribly precise. For example, in the 1918 influenza pandemic, the mortality rate was highest in young adults with the strongest inflammatory responses. Their lungs flooded with fluid and many then died of secondary bacterial pneumonia. So this was a trade-off between having a strong inflammatory response and a robust immune system that would deal with most other infections, but was inappropriate for the H1N1 variant that caused the 1918 flu epidemic. That was a, a new experience for the immune system, and it resulted in a spike in mortality uh, in people who were between about 20 and 35 years of age. So we'll come back to this in later lectures, but you can see that we have here both the percentage of people with pneumonia in blue, and we have the influenza-related mortality rate in red. The people who died were people who were at their peak physiological fitness in midlife. So what are the mechanisms that cause random change? There's mutation and the sense in which mutation is random. There are founder effects in genetic bottlenecks passaging through small population sizes. There's the Mendelian lottery the idea that meiosis is a fair coin, and there's variation in reproductive success in populations of any size. I've highlighted in red here 
the factors that contribute to, to genetic drift, and that will follow through the next couple of slides. So first, what about mutations? In what sense are they random? Well, there are several senses in which they're not random. They occur more frequently at some sites than at others. The mutation rate in pathogenic bacteria increases in response to certain signals, that is their mutation rate across mo much of their genome. Transitions, that means a purine to a purine or a pyrimidine to a pyrimidine are more common than transversions. A transversion would be a mutation that took a purine to a pyrimidine or a pyrimidine to a purine. Mutations do not produce random change in phenotype space. That means that mutations are only able to modify the phenotype that's already evolved. Now, what is the sense in which mutations really are random? This is the critical sense for evolution. There is no systematic relationship between their phenotypic effect and the needs of the organism in which they occur. Mutations are random with respect to fitness. They are not random with respect to these other things. What is the second mechanism? Well, the second mechanism causing random change are effects of small population sizes. And let's take a look at things that experience some small population sizes. The Pitcairn Islanders and other founder populations in humans and cheetahs. The founder effect occurs when just a few individuals found a new population with only a small portion of the genetic variation that was in the original stock. And when that happens, if there happens to be a mutation for a genetic disease, it can suddenly occur at high frequency because you have a few people and one of them has the mutation. In the large population, it might have been at much lower frequency. Examples are the genetic diseases in Quebec, Tay-Sachs disease, among the Afrikaners, that's porphyria, and on Pitcairn Island, which is diabetes, type 1 diabetes. The other population size effect is a genetic bottleneck. So a population crashes to very small size. This is not a founder effect. This is the same population, but it crashes to very small size. Only a few alleles then make it through because there are only a few individuals that can carry them. An example is the homozygosity of cheetahs, which is confirmed by reciprocal skin transplants. You can transplant skin between any two cheetahs in the world, and the skin transplant will not be rejected. They have lost that much genetic variation in their immune systems. Another effect that's quite important is that correlations decrease in small samples. If selection is really there, but it's rather weak, then it can only be effective in a large population. Because in a small population, the correlation of reproductive success with the trait will just be eroded by sampling error. So things get noisy in small samples. The third mechanism that is causing random change is the fact that meiosis is a fair coin. It's a very interesting observation, and it probably is the result of evolution, designing meiosis to be absolutely fair about which allele gets into which gamete. That's expressed in Mendel's law of segregation. If there are two alleles at a locus, the probability that one of them will get into a given gamete is 50%, exactly 50-50. In the long run, the average number of successful haploid gametes per parent in a diploid sexual species is two. That's because in the long run, populations are stable and organisms are just replacing themselves. If there are just two chances and two flips of the coin then, on average, individuals will just replace themselves in the population. The fourth mechanism causing random change is that the trait or the gene lands at random in families of different size, okay? That is actually what we mean by random variation and reproductive success. If an allele randomly lands in a sequence of families that have different numbers of children, it will increase or decrease at random in frequency. So that is what we mean by a zero correlation with reproductive success. This produces genetic drift. 
It's the random, aimless wandering of frequencies of neutral genes. It resembles the Brownian motion of small particles that are being pushed about by the thermal motion of molecules. And it is driven by the lottery of meiosis combined with variation in reproductive success. It fixes neutral alleles faster in smaller populations, but it occurs in populations of all sizes. Genetic drift is not confined to small populations. It's going on all the time. So what happens to neutral alleles? Well, most of them never make it to high frequency. Those that do get fixed in the population take longer to do so in larger populations. So if you're thinking about the dynamics of random change, a lot depends on how big the population is. Large populations, however, also have more mutations. You can think of the size of the population as being a net out there to catch mutations because the more genomes there are, the more times a mutation can occur. This exactly compensates for longer fixation times. So while it takes longer to fix a neutral allele in a bigger population, there are more mutations arising in that larger population which are generating neutral variants and drifting through to fixation. That results in exact compensation for the number of new neutral mutations that will be fixed in a given time period. So we don't know which mutation will be fixed, but we do know how many will be fixed on average. In that sense, this sort of process which produces a molecular clock is like an atomic clock that's driven by radioactive decay. In any given period of time, we don't know which atom will decay, but we do know how many will decay. And in fact, that's so precise that atomic clocks are an international standard for precise timekeeping. Now in both cases, the regularity emerges as the result of a very large number of independent random events. Just to give you some idea of how large that number is, the haploid human genome consists of about three times 10 to the ninth DNA base pairs. That's three billion ba base pairs. And one mole of uranium contains about six times 10 to the 23rd atoms. So there are many, many opportunities for random events to occur in both contexts. If we go back and we look at the example of evolution occurring in the genome of influenza, we can see, again, this signature of a very straight line relating how much time there has been for change to occur and the number of nucleotide substitutions. So time on the x-axis, nucleotide substitutions on the y-axis. These are influenza samples that were frozen and then sequenced later. And we can see that even though population size has fluctuated and fluctuated enormously because these things have gone through epidemics and then they've crashed and they've gone through epidemics again, substitutions were regular. The effect of population size on the number of new mutations per generation exactly compensated for the slower rate of fixation of neutral mutations in larger populations. So you can estimate time from the number of substitutions. The point about this being not being influenced by population size is important because it allows us to pick up a clear signal of how much time has elapsed even though populations have fluctuated dramatically. And you can estimate time from this molecular clock. So for example, if I told you that the number of nucleotide substitutions in a new sample was about 60 different from a base sample, that would indicate that it had been a period of about 35 years that those two were apart. That gives you a molecular clock that allows you to estimate time to last common ancestor. So to summarize, there are several reasons why variation in DNA and variation in traits might make no difference to reproductive success. Meiosis is like a fair coin. The probability of getting into a specific gamete is 50%. 
The fixation of neutral alleles is like radioactive decay. In neither case do we know which mutation will be fixed or which atom will decay, but we do know how many events will happen, and that gives us a clock. Genetic drift fixes neutral alleles at a regular rate independent of population size. And the regularity of the fixation of neutral alleles allows us to estimate times to last common ancestor by comparing DNA sequences. Thus, random evolution at the level of the population, which is microevolution, gives us a clock that allows us to put timelines on the macroevolutionary pattern of relationship and of phylogenetic trees.